Before we get things started, I'd like to mention that I've set myself up a Patreon. This is there honestly just to help me in making videos, upgrading my equipment, and assuring that I can help keep a roof over my head. Life is rough right now and anything would help out. Link in the description below, donate if you want to, and maybe follow me on Twitter and Twitch as well if you'd like to hear me go on about more stuff. Now, on with the show. So when I compare myself to other reviewers or people who do video essays, I think I'm a bit of an odd duck. Nearly everything I've reviewed on this channel has either been old nostalgic media or something that I was familiar enough that I thought I could give a really interesting topic about. While I've talked about things I've only just recently seen before on this channel, it's only with the Cuphead video last week that I've really decided that I wanted to talk about content that was either brand new or I had just seen it for the first time a bit more often. Today's subject is in the latter category, being a series that I've never seen before and that I wanted to give you all my honest thoughts on. In this case though, we're actually returning to a franchise we've seen before on the show, and one I've actually done an overview for most of the series. Unlike last time though, there is no nostalgia here, nothing to color my expectations. Prepare everyone for a flat out moderate opinion on what I think about Tenchi Muyo GXP. Hello ladies and gentlemen, I am your ever friendly Pokoprof, and welcome back to Fascinating Fiction. Yeah, we're back to Tenchi, but as I said in that rather large opening, this is the series that I'm going into blind. When it originally aired here in the States on the then-revived Toonami block, and my god does it make me feel old knowing that Toonami was revived 10 years ago, I had long since fallen out of anime and had a day job at the time. Staying up to midnight or later every night wasn't that much of an option for me. And as it was, I was best described more as a passing fan of the Tenchi series. This particular series just never popped up on my radar. So I absolutely had no idea what I was getting into when I started this series, outside of expecting some crazy sci-fi adventures with a heaping helping of harem shenanigans. And at its core, that's exactly what GXP is. But where Muyo, Universe, and even in Tokyo Tenchi's had a cohesive story, developed characters, and engaging situations, GXP kind of doesn't, and by kinda, I mean not at all. Hear me out. I will always try to give everything I talk about on this channel a fair shake, and I will never bash something to just bash it. I will try my best to be fair to every series I review, and if you love a particular series, the more power to you. I wish I could love it alongside with you. But when I try to review something, I always try to look at it with a critiquing mind, thus the channel's name. I do my best to point out the good parts, the bad parts, and what I think could have been done to make it better. When it comes to talking about GXP, I'll be honest, it's kind of hard to exactly start in any one space. Taken on its own episode by episode, some things are decently enjoyable, but it's when you look at it through the lens of the entire series that it can honestly become upsetting. Let's take our main character Seina Yamada for example. This is the focal character that we've got to work with, a young boy who joins up with the galaxy police from the Tenchi Ryooki timeline going about adventures in space. He's the one that we want to see in the middle of this harem, having all the girls fight over him while dealing with things as part of the Force. And yet, more so than just about any other character in anime that I've been exposed to, Sena has absolutely no agency. Now this in and of itself isn't normally an issue. It's common for the hero in a harem show not to have much choice in the matter, since otherwise that kind of ends the drama real fast if he chooses one of the girls over the others. But in Sena's case here, nothing in the show is caused or solved by him doing anything. Like the entire point of the show, Sena joining the Galaxy Police? This happened because his mother thought he would win some kind of reward if he signed the paperwork and then proceeded to write in his own name for him. On its own, it's a silly little gag, but taken as the reason for why the entire series takes place, it makes us ask why we're following Sena in the first place. 
And this is a constant aspect of the story, where the only reason anything in this show is happening is because another character forced Sena into it. The only thing he'll ever actually says he'll do, no matter what, is to be a part of the Galaxy Police. And that is only because if he didn't, the entire series would be over. A lot of the other characters don't fare much better, especially in the earlier episodes. The two major members of Sena's harem, Amane and Kiriko, are shown in a rather poor light. The Galaxy Police Detective herself suffers from being eye candy, with her first real moment having the camera do a triple close-up on her breasts. Kiriko, on the other hand, is painted as Sena's childhood friend, who completely dismisses Sena out of hand when it turns out he has a bit of Amane's lipstick on his face. So yeah, one shown for cheesecake and the other to cause a small bit of drama. Neither are all that good first impressions, though both of them do get better moments later on. That's actually one of the things I'm wanting to really focus on, because I think it's one of the few moments that really goes to show my frustration with this particular series. We later find out that Kiriko has actually been an undercover agent for the GXP. The why of it is never properly explained, but it's as we deal with a particularly rough band of pirates that we get to see Kiriko fight. And she's exceptionally bloodthirsty. It's in this moment that I actually got really excited watching the episode. Here's this girl that, up to this point, we've only really seen worrying about Sena and fighting with Amane, who suddenly goes around, stealthing up like the Predator, and proceeds to kill all the pirates she comes up against. I was enthralled by this, partly because when it comes to the Tenchi franchise, the only time we've ever seen a character this bloodthirsty was when they were out-and-out -out villains of the series. Especially when Kiriko comes out of stealth, covered in blood, with Sena looking at her like a monster, this? This had to be something that carries on, where the characters have to discuss why she did this and how she came to this role. And it never happens. That's right. This moment here, this really cool character moment that would make Kiriko stand out not just amongst her own cast, but amongst the Tenshi group as well, never mentioned ever again. Instead, we learn about how she is a Misaki like Tenshi and thus part of the Jirai family. Hell, not only do we get introduced to another Jiraiyan character in Seto, who we'll get to in a moment, but we're given a full lesson about the family tree of the Jiraiyans. I am dead serious. In no less than three times in the series that I can recall, and I'm almost certain there's more than that, we stop the entire episode so the characters can tell us who's related to who when it comes to the royal lineage, be they who they married, what characters birth what character, or how long some of these characters live, and... Oh no, I've gone cross-eyed. And then there's Seto, the devil princess of Jirai herself. You remember earlier when I complained about Sena not having any agency in this show? This is the reason why. Seto here is the mastermind behind roughly 80% of the series, with events and actions on pretty much the entire cast happening because she wants it to. This includes things like Kiriko suddenly getting a Jiraiyan tree, as well as the reasons for Sena being moved up in rank, all to suit her own designs. This is also while at the same time putting the show's protagonist into the back seat so she can win the day against a bunch of pirates in one of the later episodes. I will say as a good point here that Seto is one of my favorite characters animation-wise because they just love to give her this monstrous face that looks more fitting on a snake than a human. What else am I missing so far? Oh, how about the fact that we've got a space pirate named Ryoko in the series? She's got no relation to the original Tenchi one at all. Her name's just Ryoko, and she's a space pirate. Oh, and a princess. I'm not even going to try to explain that last bit, but I will say despite the absolute nonsense of having another space pirate Ryoko running around, this is actually one of the points of the series that I felt was well done. And since I am wanting to talk about some good points of the show, Here's what happens. 
At this point of the series, all the major characters have been established, with the focus usually being on Sena, Kiriko, Amane, and a lion-like character by the name of Irma, with the four of them eventually living together at one point. We see that throughout this entire time, Irma has pretty much become infatuated with Sena like the other girls, effectively making her part of the harem. But we later learn from Ryoko that she's actually got someone on the inside for the GXP that works for the pirates. Considering that we saw Irma before doing some rather underhanded deeds, you'd think it's easy to just have her be that person on the inside. But then the anime reveals that they are indeed one and the same, Ryoko having the ability to shapeshift back and forth between the two forms. What's cool about this is despite how poor the anime has been up to this point in showing cause and effect when it comes to anything else, we do get hints that the two characters are one, with things like Sena being able to recognize Irma's perfume as Ryoko's, who he had met not long before that point. There are just other little nods here and there that eagle-eyed viewers could easily use to figure things out. It's kind of sad that this kind of storytelling doesn't continue throughout the rest of the series once this is revealed. My god, this episode is all over the place and I've not even covered half the stuff I've been wanting to talk about. Like how we follow the adventures of these three cadets that were on the ship that picked Sena up in the first episode. They're in the main theme song of the entire show, so they've got to be important, right? Nope! These characters end up just having little points in episodes where they pop in, do a joke or two that has to deal with how they're not that intelligent, and then we don't see them again for a while. Eventually, they actually end up joining up with the pirates, because for them, that is not only a cooler job, but then they also get access to all the pirate women as well. One episode even focuses on how they are put in charge of a large sum of money to captain a new pirate ship only to lose it all because they spent it on partying for over a week straight. Of course, me mentioning that little story bit reminds me of the pirates themselves, and that there are two characters I have got to cover within that when it comes to the villains of the series, Serio and Tarant Shank. Let's go over Serio first, since not only is he the least headache-inducing of the two, but I actually consider him to be the main villain. Yes, I know it's Tarant, but it isn't, and I'll explain in a bit. So, Serio here is actually a character who got his start in the Tenshi Ryooki series, as a way to get Ayeka to return home. It didn't work, and the events of that episode led Serio into hating all Earthlings, which is pretty much the state of his entire character throughout this show. He hates Sena for being from Earth and everything he represents, even more so when Sena actually starts getting attention from Amane, whom our pink hair villain here had originally dated. The entire purpose he serves, especially earlier on in the anime, is to literally be a loudmouth braggart going on about how superior he is, only for him to get knocked down a peg, usually by Amane, but sometimes just by his surroundings. Basically think Team Rocket for Pokemon if you had them appear three times in an episode. I'll admit it, he's actually one of my favorite parts of the series simply because I actually got enjoyment out of seeing just how he'd get smack around in the next scene. So why do I say he's the main villain and Tarant isn't? It's all because of this particular moment. Yeah, when the joke character, the team rocket of your show, is able to win a duel in a single sword slash against the supposedly main villain of your show, then there is something wrong with your villain. And since we're on the subject of Tarant, and he's one of the last things we're going to be talking about before we get to the background of this show, let's get to it. As a character, he actually starts off as perhaps the most interesting thing of the anime. He's a no-nonsense pirate who's known for being ruthless, and the reason he actually hates Sena and wishes to kill him is because Sena was involved in the capturing of his father's spaceship. The only reason he doesn't do this is because of that awesome scene with Kiriko I talked about before, catching him off guard enough for him to get stabbed by Sena. It's at this point that everything goes downhill for Tarant. 
Remember that whole thing about Ryoko being Irma that I talked about? That was revealed because Tarant had blackmailed her into killing Sena, something that even the pirates themselves found despicable. After that, he tries tricking them aboard his ship, only for the main cast to destroy it with their own. You'd think that kill him, but nope, Tarant survives, though he's now part cyborg. But if you think that's bad, oh no, it gets even more insane. You see, later on in the series, Tarant is trying again to kill Sena. Only this time around, our protagonist has his own mecha. No, I'm not going to explain it. The anime barely does anything to explain it. What happens is that the mecha goes and crushes Tarant's ship into the size of a golf ball. And guess what? He survives this as well. And he comes back again! The final time that we get to see his character is in one of the final episodes, disguised as a butler to try and get Santa alone and kill him on his wedding day. Oh my god, I forgot about the wedding day. Okay, quick rundown on this and then we're done. We're moving on to the background of this insanity because I'm honestly not sure any of this is making any sense anymore. Point is, Seto is a matchmaker, likes pairing up people. In this case, Amane, Kiriko, Ryoko, and Neiju, a character I'm not even getting into because no, all just want Sena to be happy as they're all in love with him at this point. So Seto sets up that they all should get married to Sena because who actually cares anymore at this point and it doesn't matter anyway. That's right, it doesn't matter, because he gets kidnapped by four other characters who have been in the background of various scenes this entire time while working under Sato, because their territory and space has been overrun by pirates and Sena is just what they need to stop them. Why does this involve all four of these new girls forcing themselves on Sena while on camera, in front of royalty, the police, and God knows who else? I don't know, and I don't give a damn! Oh, that's a short stop. Okay. Okay. Calm down, Prof. We're out of the toughest neck of the woods. We talk about how this series came to be, and then we're done for the day. Alright then. Here goes. So to start things off, the man who is responsible for this anime is Senichi Watanabe, the man who's probably most well known for the anime adaptation of Excel Saga. His style, from what I've seen, is over the top and crazy, and is well known for putting a character that looks like him into the animes he's worked on. If you've ever seen a character that's dressed up like Lupin III with an afro called Nabishin, that's him. He's actually in GXP himself as the character NB, but I hated that character so much and we were already dealing with just so much crazy information, that's all I'm going to be saying about the character. There's two major things about Watanabe I would like to talk about though. The first is that we've actually talked about one of his series before on the channel, though I didn't know about it at the time. You remember the wallflower? Road to womanhood and all that? Yeah, he's the director there too, with his character being in there as well. I can only assume that the reason I liked that anime over GXP here simply came down to the point the fact that Wallflower had a manga that Watanabe had to follow, and thus he couldn't be anywhere near as chaotic. Or he mellowed out, I could honestly believe either. But the other thing I wanted to bring up, and probably the biggest thing about this entire situation, was the fact that Misaki Kajishima, the creator of Tenchi, actually didn't like GXP. From what I've been told, it's actually a little bit closer to hate than anything else. Because of this, Kajishima actually has created several novels retelling the entire story of GXP as how he would have preferred it. From what I saw, there are a total of 17 of these novels. And I think it speaks a lot about the quality of this series if even the original creator has a strong distaste for it. The last thing we're going to be talking about today relating to the background of GXP is probably the fact that, out of all of the Tenchi franchises, this is the one that has a deep and direct connection to the anime series Duel, Parallel Trouble Adventure that was also created by Kajishima. 
While I can't say anything about Duel itself, having never seen it, from what I've been able to gather, Duel's series actually takes place within the same universe as GXP, billions of years ago before the series itself. I've even seen a detail that Sana's character is a reincarnation of Duel's original character, and then there's this astral thing that explains the whole reason why Sana has so many women attracted to him, and I'm gonna stop right now before I go cross-eyed again. If it hasn't been made clear by this point, Tenchi Muyo GXP is a rather insane anime. It's designed to be off-the-wall humor, made even worse so by a creative director who's known for being over the top. While decently animated, especially in its time of the early 2000s, this is a series that I couldn't ever recommend to anyone outside of the most die-hard Tenchi Muyo fans. And even then, I think it's an incredibly hard sell. What few shiny moments of character or story aren't ever followed up upon, things happen just because that's what the director was told was going to happen, without there being any real impact on the story, and the end result was so bad that the original creator of the series decided to basically do his own novelized version of the events to better fit his vision. I've legitimately got to ask though, for those who love Tenchi Muyo GXP, why? What about this series draws you in and makes you want to stay? I'd even be fine if the answer was just nostalgia, because at this point, I gotta know just what it is about this particular Tenchi series that drew people in, because frankly, I don't understand it myself. But with all that said, I hope that I've done a good job to entertain you, and I'll do my best to do so in the future. Hopefully you'll follow along with my content by subscribing and doing all the other things that gives us YouTubers life. Until next time, stay frosty. I'm going to frickin' bed.